Hello, everyone. Welcome, NAB 17. I don't know how many years I've done this, but it, it, it sounds like we've done it too many times. But every year is different, right? We know that. There's always good things about every year being different. And I actually was here a year ago doing a similar topic to this, but I get the benefit of the Earth going around the sun an entire time and picking up new data. And so that data, I think, is pretty poignant, and we're going to little dig into that uh, today. So this is significant stuff and pretty exciting. And what we're calling this today is where the puck is going to be. And if you've ever heard that phrase before, it's, a, it's sort of a hockey phrase, right? Anticipation, that's what that is. Because Wayne Gretzky, they would say, how, how are you so good at hockey? And he says, I can predict where the puck's gonna be. And there are some people out there that are predicting where the puck's gonna be. And based on that, they're really killing it. And then there are some people who are going for where the puck is. And by the time they get there, it's not there anymore. And this is the problem. And uh, this is what we're gonna kind of examine today. And I have some really cool examples to help get your minds thinking about how this is gonna work and identifying other areas, other markets where this is happening. Because I think sometimes if you go too sharp, at NAB with uh, problems with certain business models, people get turned off because they're like, well, that's kind of offensive. That kind of hurts because that's my job. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna level it off a little bit, round it off by talking about other markets and other industries and then applying that to where we're going. So my name is Michael Cioni. I am the uh, uh, product director of a new camera called the Millennium DXL and also the president of innovation at Panavision and Light Iron. And so this is one of my projects which is really exciting is making sure that people have the most advanced camera system in the world which the Millennium DXL is and that's not what we're going to talk about today but I recommend you guys taking a look at that. And then uh, Light Iron is a post-production group that specializes in high resolution and very forward-thinking ideology because there's a lot of places you can get the same quality of work, but what's different is the philosophy behind the people that are doing it. And so this is really important to me that people understand what we believe and why we believe it. And so we're going to talk about that starting with this concept I have called chain reactions. Now chain reactions are interesting because I think sometimes when things are set in motion, you have successes and failures, and some of the successes can be traced to things such as chain reactions. And so we're going to identify a couple of those because if you can understand the ingredients of a chain reaction, it can really, really help you in tough decision making. So for entrepreneurs and engineers and creatives and artists, all these people uh, that are trying to make something, if you work for a company and your job is to push, push it to the next level, or if you're a filmmaker and your job is to try to make a better result, a better project, these are all things that I think we can identify through chain reactions. So we're going to start with the first one way back in 1985. Shakespeare says what is past is prologue. So we're going to go all the way back to 1985 and use this first example. So in 1985, Sony releases the Discman as a follow-up to the Walkman. But essentially what they do that's so amazing is in 16 years, Sony sells 46 million Discman. 46 million Discman. Now remember, the incumbent to the Discman Walkman world was records, right? Vinyl. And so they were building something, and that's the first ingredient to a chain reaction. Your product has to start by being more convenient. That's the most basic element of getting a chain reaction is convenience. And so the Discman essentially was more convenient than records and things like uh, vinyl and speakers and stereo amplifiers and stuff like that. So they sell 46 million of them in 16 years, which is amazing, right? Until Apple comes along. And then Apple, in only 13 years, sells 390 million iPods. 390 million iPods, so how is this possible? Because it's like, if you think about it, when you put these products next to each other, how is one eight and a half times more successful than the other? Because if you look at them, they're both about the same size, they both use batteries, they both play music, but the thing is, from a convenience perspective, they're equal. So convenience is that first ingredient to getting that chain reaction. And these guys are about equally convenient. But then Apple takes it to the second ingredient. What's the second ingredient? It's control. And the reason the second ingredient is control is really interesting. And if you really think back to how music was consumed in the 1980s and 90s in, the, uh, in that time period, people would actually record music from the radio they would rip their own CDs and they would make their own mixtapes. I know you did it, you remember doing it, you made your own mixtapes. But this is what's interesting about the mixtape, break that down. The mixtape itself 
is the antithesis of how the record industry's business model was. Because the record industry's business model was album based. These people thought that the consumers wanted albums, but if they would have just listened to how people used the product, they would have said, no, we don't want albums, we want mixtapes, we want variety, we want to control it. And so we had to make our own mixtapes and mix CDs, even though the market selling it to us didn't know how to do it for us. The Apple iPod was essentially a mixtape. That's what it gave. So it gave control to the user, which is that second element of a chain reaction. And by giving it control, you're able to get that chain reaction going. So I know that's an old example, so now we're going to go a little bit modern. We're going to start with Uber. Everybody knows how Uber works. So Uber is going to start with a convenience factor, right? Because you got to make it more convenient. So the convenience factor with Uber starts with GPS and things like remote and auto pay, which is much more con you know, convenient for the consumer compared to taxi services or livery drivers and things like that. So that's that first ingredient. But people will automatically jump and say, well, Uber is so successful. Why are they so successful? Well, convenience is number one, but then there's that second element, right? We talked about control. So what are the control elements of, of Uber? Well, it gives you in the form of location services. You can tell people where you're going to be, where you're going to go, and they can give you an estimate of how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. So that gives the user a lot more control. But control plus uh, convenience isn't enough necessarily to make the whole chain reaction go bonkers. And that third ingredient is the one that is the hardest to achieve, it's the hardest to find, but it's the most significant in getting a chain reaction. And that third ingredient comes to us in the form of inspiring some form of change. You gotta inspire some form of change if you're gonna galvanize millions and millions and millions of people to get on board with your idea. And, and it comes to us in the form with Uber in a very clever way. You see, Uber shows up with this idea of a rating. You know, the rating itself is not the product. The rating itself is not the thing that you buy from Uber, but it starts to have a relationship between the driver and the passenger. And that gives us this inspired change. We change our behavior. We change our opinion of the company because there's accountability now. And even though you don't buy that accountability as the actual product itself, you use that accountability to improve your relationship with them. So let's look at two other examples of how this works and plays out, and then we're going to apply it to the media and motion picture and television industry, and we're going to see the results. Blue Apron is an example that's very interesting because we are not going to have grocery stores about, at about 10 years from now, the grocery store will completely go extinct because of things like this. Blue Apron is one company that totally understands where the puck is going to be. And here is why. They start with convenience. They have a delivery service and they're, they're, they have the efficiency of uh, giving you the ingredients you want. And then of course you have experts. You have people that are giving you the recipes. You have chefs that are producing the recipes necessary for you to actually get exactly what you want. So this is the convenience. Then we move into control. Control with Blue Apron is very clever. All these systems that are going to upset the business model for grocery stores is pretty cool. It comes in the form of portions. See, a grocery store couldn't care less what aisle you go down. They don't care how much you buy or how many you're buying for. Some people would consider a grocery store kind of like a... Uh, an opportunity for temptation, right? And so it can be kind of a tempting place to go down the aisles you shouldn't go down. But Blue Apron gives you those portions a little bit careful and they're, and they're making it smaller. So that is much more efficient, their value goes up. But then there's that third ingredient, the intangible ingredient that gives you inspired change. And it comes to us from Blue Apron in the form of being healthier. Remember, grocery stores don't care about what you put into your body. But Blue Apron tells you, by starting a relationship, we care how you feel and we want you to be healthier and we're gonna help you do that. You're not buying health as the Blue Apron product. It's the intangible part of that product that inspires you to change, which is why your loyalty goes up and your desire to work with them uh, grows. And that is where their tipping point goes and Blue Apron is the model that's gonna replace all of grocery stores. One more outside example, and then we're gonna turn this into our example. Warby Parker is a great example of a company that only five years ago was valued, seven years ago was valued at one and a half million dollars. And last year they closed 2016 at 1.5 billion dollar valuation. Now how did that happen so quickly? Well here's another group that is willing to challenge the business model of the, uh, the lens in industry. And so they start with convenience. They deliver the glasses to your house. They're a lot more efficient. And then you have this huge benefit of your expert opinions when it comes to glasses. 
You see, the experts in your life when it comes to glasses are your friends, they're your family, they're your coworkers. These people kind of know how you are. And so you get a bunch of glasses that come to your home and you can decide what you're gonna wear. And if you think about it, if you have to put something on your face every single day, don't you wanna spend a little bit more than about an hour making that decision? And so the business model changes and then they go from convenience and they give you that trial period. So you get to keep this and that gives you that control. You have control because you get a trial period, you get to share the glasses with other people and they give it back to you. But then there's one more element that inspired change. And the inspired change with, with Warby Parker comes in the form of a donation. Every single pair of glasses that we buy from Warby Parker, they give a pair of glasses away to a developing nation. So you have a whole group of people, over a million people have received glasses, and even though we don't actually consider the giving away donation part of the product, this is the thing that is the intangible element that galvanizes us and starts to create inspired change. So whether or not it is belonging to a purpose, or being healthier, or just behaving when you're in a car. These are these inspired change elements that put these companies, as an example, into these massive developments of becoming chain reactions. So what happens if we apply this information into the motion picture industry? What can we learn from this model? Well, this is where it gets really exciting and also very telling. You see, the similarity with all those business models is that they all heavily rely on an IT infrastructure. Their success and failure is based on information technology. And we know that that is going, uh, becoming more and more reliable and dependent in the, the companies that are growing. But the problem with that is it is here today and it's gone today. The problem with that is people start to get complacent because stuff changes so fast that people don't know how to keep up with it. So they start to get complacent. If you don't understand how to keep up with it or you fear from that, we start to take that complacency and we grow fear and then we stop changing and we don't recognize the change that's actually happening or we don't want to engage in it ourselves. This is the problem because I believe if you look at this formula, this IT integration element, and if you get complacent with the status quo, the problem is this, complacency with the status quo will decide who lives and who dies in arts and sciences. And we are seeing new groups that are growing because they're willing to challenge the status quo. And we're at the very beginning of seeing groups fail and die off because they're trying to protect the status quo. This is what that looks like. I believe the future of people, the future of arts and entertainment professionals are gonna be equally minded, technologically driven and creatively driven. I call that being technative. You need to realize that the value of having a balance between a technology mindset and a creative mindset is a healthy way to approach problem solving. And it will help you understand how you can be able to change and not get complacent with the status quo. The worst thing that can happen is a picture like this. If you have two groups going at it, and this is happening every single day, and you can start putting the company logos in your head. If you have groups going at you, and one group has a vested interest in protecting the status quo, and they are fighting against a group that is interested in reform, if they are the same size and the same weight at the same speed with the same mass, when they hit each other, all of that work is eliminated. Because when two masses hit each other at the same speed, then nobody wins, it just goes to nowhere. What can actually happen that's worse, and this is like welcome to my life, is you have people that have a vested interest in protecting the status quo and they have more power, more influence, more money, more resources than people that are fighting for reformation and they overpower it. This is the most common thing. And if you want, you can walk around this floor and find tons and tons of companies that have a vested interest in protecting the status quo. And that's why they're here, is to state their claim and maintain their dominance with the status quo. They're everywhere. The best thing that can happen is that the people that want reformation are able to get organized and push through it and able to overpower those groups that are trying to protect the status quo. And this is possible with where we're going in terms of a new media chain reaction. So this is where it gets really hairy, but also really exciting because we're gonna make a prediction today about where the media industry is gonna be, where that puck is going to be. And here's how it's going to look. You understand that the arts and sciences and content information groups are pretty compartmentalized. So we essentially have 
uh, uh, theatrical and broadcast and broadband and music and gaming and AR and VR, they are all generally pretty compartmentalized. And the companies that are on top of all these are essentially different companies. There are a few exceptions, but generally we like to have these vertically integrated groups that are separate based on the specialty that they have for their business model. But here's what's going to happen. As IT integration continues to move forward, you're going to see all of these groups moving towards the internet. So theatrical, you're starting to see move towards the internet. And of course, television is moving towards the internet. And the broadbanders are all over the internet. And music and gaming, they're all going to be moving to the internet. As this happens, look what's going to happen with the companies. Some of these companies are just going to go away because they're unnecessary anymore. Other groups of companies are going to merge, they're going to purchase each other, or they're going to start working extremely closely in cooperative capacities in a new way. So you're going to see an entire new ecosystem happen, and this is all going to happen over the next five years. It's going to be a blink of an eye when you think about the, the size of this. Now broadcasters, since this is NAB and this is a broadcasters convention, I want to give some props to the broadcasters because they have some major advantage because when you think about their convenience factor, they do have convenience over theatrical because they provide a service that's a little bit more convenient for users than theatrical. Plus, we have this other group. And this other group, the Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Google, YouTube, Hulu group, these are the groups that are challenging the status quo and they're the ones that are starting to factor in how they can take advantage of the convenience that's delivered through broadcast and make it even more convenient through broadband. So here's how that's gonna look. We have to examine a new business model because this is a changing business model and this business model is different enough that it's going to create a lot of winners and a lot of losers. And the best part about this is we're all involved in it. We are involved in it mostly in two capacities. One, you are part of the change because you work in the industry that is going to be affected by it. Either you're one of the people that is going to get removed or you're going to be the people that's going to be the removers. You're going to be either part of reformation or part of protection of status quo. But in either case, you have a say in it. But then you also have a say in it because you're also a consumer. You know, if you're a consumer, you also get to receive this stuff in your own home and you get to decide how you like it or receive it or don't like it. So let's look at this and we're going to start with identifying how this chain reaction works. So we're going to go back 10 years. So about 10 years ago, these groups start emerging with content. Now at that time, the content isn't original. It doesn't technologically look that good yet. And you can get this content pretty much anywhere else, but it is a little bit more convenient because they're delivering it to your home on demand, over the top, and on the go. So you have a little bit of convenience and audiences are saying, okay, so I have this internet solution and these groups are not producing the best content. They don't have original content yet, but they're giving me giving me something a little more convenient. It doesn't even technologically work that well, but it's starting to. And that's the beginning of this chain reaction 10 years ago. And audiences said, this is really good. But then we have the consumer electronics industry and they say, this is a great opportunity because we can resell our technology all over again to all these people. So the consumer electronic industry gets all excited and the audiences say, great, we'll get a better television, we'll get a better set-top box, we're getting better results. So the audiences are getting pretty excited about that in consumer electronics. But then we got the theatrical groups. Now 10 years ago, and 10 to 12 years ago, the theatrical group Theatrical groups were generally still film-based distribution. And so the exhibition in the theaters was film-based. And they said, oh, let's change that out. Let's start adding digital projectors to our system. So the audiences said, yeah, that's a lot better. So we got digital audiences seeing digital theatrical projection. We've got the consumer electronics industry driving new technology. And then we've got the broadbanders starting to say, OK, we've got new technology through broadband. So this is all setting up. Everybody's happy. Everybody's making money. Everything's good, right? Of course not. Now it's going to change because people that are in the reformation group are going to push harder. So here's what happens. The media industry driven by OTT has this new element because they're going to take convenience and they're going to add that second ingredient of control. Control from the OTT groups comes to us in the form of bi-directional communication. You realize that broadcast and theatrical is a push system. It pushes elements directly to you. But the internet is a pull system. And not only is it a pull system, it also is a push system. It can go both ways. Because there's a passive process when you're dealing with theatrical and you're dealing with broadcast where you're just on the receiving end of information, but you can't share it back. You can't communicate back. In fact, in theatrical, when you're sitting in a theater, 
They make you turn your phone off. The product that you love the most, you're not even allowed to use it to push information back, which is part of their business problem. So we've got this new convenience and control through this bi-directional communication. And that bi-directional communication is your smartphone, it's location services, it's gaming, it's music, all integrated together. And the OTT groups have a control element that broadcast and theatrical simply lack and cannot reproduce. So what happens after that? Well, the audiences say, we're really into this. And so this is about five years ago where all this starts to, to, to make sense with OTTs and they gain a lot of power. So then now we're in the present day. And to respond to this, the theatrical groups say, well, we got to respond to this. Because the theatrical groups are not asleep at the wheel. They're not saying, we don't know this is happening. They're trying to figure out what can we do in order to compete with the control that the OTT people have. And here's what the theatrical industry is doing. And I believe that they are trying, this is their attempt to be relevant and maintain relevancy with consumers. But I believe this is actually going to be their demise. And I think I can prove it. Here is what they are doing. First thing they're doing is they're double stacking their projectors. So they're trying to make the theatrical experience brighter. So they're pushing double projection systems and calling it high dynamic range display. That is better. Then they're actually taking any space in the ceiling and putting a speaker there. If you can find an empty space, you're going to see a speaker in a movie theater. They're going to put a speaker every single place they can, under your seat included. Then they're going to remove half the seats of the theater. And they're going to charge $24 a ticket, and they're going to put really cozy seats in there. And they're going to have less people in it and say, this is going to be better comfortable. You're going to have more uh, space in there and less people. And then they're going to make the seats rumble. And essentially what they're doing is they're turning the theatrical experience into some sort of ride. And this is their idea to maintain that relevancy. But there's a major flaw with this business plan. There's a huge flaw with this business plan because I could argue that a brighter screen, more speakers, and rumble seats will make an action movie better. It will enhance the experience. But see, in the past, up until now, the theatrical groups have not been in charge of the type of content that goes theatrical. That's not their job. That's not been their influence. And the problem is, when you factor in brighter screens, more speakers, and rumble seats, that does not make a comedy funnier, and it does not make a drama sadder. Inadvertently, the technology that they're using to put inside theaters is inadvertently going to decrease the films that are not action-based. Because they got to fill those seats up that they've put in there, and they got to make use of this ride experience that they've created. But a lot of people don't want to just see the same type of film. And that's never been something we've had to deal with before. So all of a sudden, people that want the dramas and the comedies and the dramedies have to go to another place in order to get that. Well, where do you think they're going to go? The OTT groups have already understood there is a demand for content, and it's in a way that they're not able to get necessarily over the air or over theatrical. And so they're going to increase not just the superhero effect, but they're also going to increase comedies and dramas. And then they're also going to say, well, we're going to do music and we're going to do uh, talk shows. We're going to have education and children's programming, classic films, and all sorts of uh, variations. And so all the type of content you, you, that you, can, you can't get in a theater is going to be there. In fact, theaters have been trying to put anything other than a movie in the theaters for a long time. They've tried to make them experiences. They've tried to have concerts. They've tried to have uh, different types of uh, events inside theaters. And it never really worked because the convenience and the control limitations were always still in place. And you can't get that chain reaction without convenience and control and inspired change. The OTT groups are inspiring change through giving these other alternatives, and then they're working technologically through 4K resolution, high dynamic range, and wide color to enhance the experience technologically in the home. So you have the benefit of the content, and content is king, and then you have the benefit of the technological elements, and then you have the benefit of the bi-directional communication that exists through your smartphone, through your family, through your home computer, through the smart television, which is a push and a pull system together. And the audiences are going bananas for it because they're responding to not just the content, not just the quality of the look, but they're responding to that intangible, that inspired change, that relationship that is because of the quality and the width and the variation of things that they're being given. I believe that that is the ingredient. If you are a broadcaster, you're 
you're not where the puck is going to be. If you're a theatrical group, you're not where the puck is going to be. And that's important coming for me because my core business is theatrical. So I'm inside, this, this, this isn't good for me, by the way. And it's this element right here, this bi-directional communication. This is the key ingredient. And if you want to make your relevant, if you want to maintain relevancy in broadcast and theatrical, you have to challenge your own business model and understand how can we make a bi-directional relationship possible inside of a theatrical environment or broadcast environment. If you fail to do that and change your business model to respond to that, you will not be relevant in less than a decade, probably closer to five years. And this is arguably a mathematical certainty. But change always creates opportunity. And I'll, I'll end with this. I wanted to give some opportunities. And so this is what's really good about being around a bunch of intelligent people. See change, and then you can try to solve it. Because we put our heads together, we can solve these problems. Because I don't want to see certain groups go away. I would love to see all the groups elevate together. But I don't think that's going to happen. Because, to be honest, most of the people that need to hear what I'm showing you right now aren't here right now. And that's a little disappointing. But you are the advocates for those people, and so you need to bring this information back to the mothership so that the mothership knows which direction they should turn. So here are four opportunities. First of all, change creates opportunities. So the first one, you need to be willing to take on existing business models, even the proven business models. You've got to be willing to do that. That, you know, in the travel industry with Airbnb and hotels, with shipping, uh, glasses, with Amazon, and uh, of course Airbnb and things like that, with, with Blue Apron and groups like that, uh, music distribution, iTunes, you know, we don't have Blockbuster anymore, we, we don't have Tower Records anymore. All these are groups of people that didn't understand how to respond to where the puck is going to be, and that's why groups like Blockbuster don't exist, and that's why groups like Kodak almost don't exist, or groups like uh, Best Buy won't exist. So these are things you've got to be willing to address and identify even proven business models. The second one is opportunities can be hard to identify. It's hard to see this stuff. It can be very camouflage. The rapid percentage change of adoption is more influential than the number of adopters. What that means is that sometimes people say a market is 1% of the market. A, a, a sect of the market is only representative 1%. Not a big deal. The next year it's 2%. Not a big deal. The next year it's 4%. Still not a big deal. But the rate of change is doubling every single year. And so people sometimes forget that small percentages are really valuable if their rate of growth is so significant. So something like a 1% doesn't seem big, but if one comes from half a percent and goes to two, then all of a sudden we have something humongous. So you've got to be able to identify those changes and opportunities. Third opportunity, consumers who understand how the technology works can influence what the content actually is. See, don't underestimate how smart the next generation consumer is. I know, I'm sure every generation always likes to point out they don't like them like they used to or there's some sort of problem with the generation coming up behind them. I don't think that's ever been different, probably forever. But never underestimate the group of people that are going to become the next gen of consumers, right? Because they're the people that have the most money to spend. And so you want to let them have a venue in which they can spend their money in the way that they want. Remember, the, uh, uh, remember the, the thing at the beginning I said that the music industry was wrong, their business model was based on albums, but people consume music based on singles and songs. That was wrong with their business model and Apple capitalized because they re-challenged the model. The same thing applies here. Listen to how your customers are using your products and if you don't really understand how the customer is using your product, someone else is gonna figure out how the customer is using it and they're gonna make the product work better and they will go viral in seven years, they will become the new leader. And the last one, entrepreneurs and technitives should identify key ingredients that can lead to chain reactions. We need to be willing to look and identify where the chain reactions are, and we need leaders. We need technologists, we need engineers, we need artists, we need creatives, we need producers, and we need technologists, and, and we need technitives, people that are willing to do that together. This is the thing that is really, really significant because if we can identify where those chain reactions come from, we can sort of anticipate where they're going. So for the entrepreneurs, for the artists, for the engineers, for the technitives out there, if you can work on some of these ideas and apply the business models and the changes in the marketplace that come from other industries, 
don't assume that just because it's happened to music and it's happened to the hotel industry and it's happened to the shipping industry or it's happening in the car industry, don't assume that content is immune. None of us are immune. It's all going to change and it's gonna keep changing. And for the people that are part of the OTT revolution, they need to also maintain the ability to change and respond and adapt because constant change is necessary in order to provide uh, the solution for a constantly changing and moving market. We have had a luxurious time where the market hasn't changed that much over the course of 50 years. It really hasn't. All of a sudden, this ITT infrastructure is the change. And because of that, we're gonna be in great shape. So I wanted to thank you guys so much uh, for uh, joining me today. Happy NAB 2017, everybody.